The endocannabinoid system is something that most primary care physicians really have never heard of. And it's a shame because the cannabinoid one receptor is really the single most densely populated G protein coupled seven transmembrane domain receptor in the human brain. And whenever I give a lecture, I ask people, how many of you learned about that in medical school? And nobody ever raises their hand. And to me, that shows the degree of the absurdity of uh, cannabis prohibition, that we don't even learn about the single most densely populated receptor in the human brain. So why do we and all animal species down through sponges have this system of cannabinoid receptors? It's because just like endorphins, we also make our own endogenous cannabinoids, the so-called endocannabinoids. Michael Pollan, the journalist, I think, gave the best explanation as to why we have this system of cannabinoid receptors and endocannabinoids, particularly anandamide and 2-AG. And he says that they're there to help us to forget. That's what he proclaimed in his book, The Botany of Desire. In his next book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, Michael is trying to gather his own food and he's crouched in the woods trying to shoot a deer with a gun on his shoulder, a rifle, and he says, this is painful. And then he postulates that the reason we and all animal species down through sponges have cannabinoid receptors and endocannabinoids is to help us to forget pain. And I think that's the lesson. He said it right. So cannabis uh, is a very useful plant. Uh, I was just a member of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Committee that reviewed all of the published literature in medical journals on the health effects of cannabis published since 1999, which was the last time the Institute of Medicine reviewed the topic. And we concluded that there was substantial to conclusive evidence that cannabis is useful in the treatment of pain. Now we said cannabis and cannabinoids. Cannabinoids are the chemicals in cannabis. There are about a hundred different of these so-called cannabinoids. And delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol is the most well-known, and that is licensed and available in a capsule in two different forms, dronabinol and nabilone. So a lot of the research that's been done is looking at the pharmaceutical delta-9 THC. Much less research is done on the whole plant cannabis, and that's largely due to the fact that in this country, cannabis is considered a Schedule One substance, which means it has a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. And the only legal source of cannabis to do research with in this country, despite the fact that patients can access cannabis from all sorts of different dispensaries, is NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And they've made it very clear to me that they are the National Institute on Drug Abuse and not for drug abuse. NIDA has to provide investigators with cannabis, but they cannot fund any clinical trials that are looking at the potential health benefit. And that's why most of the research that we were able to review in this committee of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine is looking at the potential harmful effects because that's what NIDA funds. So the research looking at potential benefit of the plant itself is not really there. But there is enough that we were able to say that cannabinoids and cannabis may be useful for pain, for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and for spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis. We said that there was no evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids was useful in seizures, but I think since we reviewed literature that was published now there's an increasing body of evidence that suggests that particularly the cannabinoid cannabidiol or CBD does seem to have some utility and this comes from a clinical trial conducted by GW Pharmaceuticals looking at their pharmaceutical Epidolex uh, form of CBD. But I think, you know, as more research can be done either with the plant, whole plant extract or the isolated cannabinoids, will be very impressed with the potential medical benefits of cannabis. Well, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine in the report that we issued in January 
2017 made some recommendations on how to improve the climate of research for investigating cannabis. And basically they called for governmental agencies and research institutions to come together and have a, a conference to review it. That hasn't happened yet, unfortunately. Uh, what needs to happen? I think cannabis being a Schedule One substance with a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use makes it quite difficult to study. And the fact that when we talk about cannabis, gee, it's a plant, and there are many different strains, so-called chemovars of the plant. Some are richer in tetrahydrocannabinol, some are richer in cannabidiol, some are maybe enriched for other of the cannabinoids. Even the terpenes, other chemicals in the plant may contribute uh, to potential medicinal benefits. So since there's such a wide array of plant material and a wide array of means of ingestion, inhalation, under the tongue, swallowing, topical suppositories, you know, it's really gonna be hard for the, the cart to catch up to the horse, if you will, because patients are telling us that this stuff works for a number of different things, but physicians, we want randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind clinical trials, and they're just not there yet. So I believe that primary care physicians need to learn about what cannabis is and what it does and what its potential medical utility is in therapeutic settings. Cannabis was removed from the U.S. Pharmacopoeia in 1942. So most physicians, I'll say all physicians, have been trained during the era of cannabis prohibition, where not only did we not learn about the endocannabinoid system and cannabinoid receptors, but we don't learn anything about cannabis as medicine. There are an increasing number of courses available online or that people can attend. Uh, some states that are approving medicinal cannabis are now requiring a certain amount of education that they're offering to primary care physicians. And I would urge people to take advantage of those offerings and learn what cannabis is and what it isn't. Again, the knowledge base is still not as complete as we'd like it to be, largely due to cannabis's still relatively prohibited uh, standings, especially with our federal government. So if you live in a state like I do, California, where we've been able to prescribe or recommend, actually not prescribe, cannabis since 1996, you just have to trust that your state, if anything happens with the federal government, will protect you because, you know, so far state rights seem to be predominating in this situation, but with our current administration, I don't think anything's ever sacrosanct for sure. Well, again, you know, I, I would say that being an oncologist in San Francisco for the last 34 years has really convinced me that cannabis is a useful medicine for my patients. I can recommend one medicine to people who have chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, loss of appetite, insomnia, anxiety, depression, and pain. Instead of writing prescriptions for five different medicines, I can say, why don't you try cannabis? And the number of patients who benefit is quite significant. I also ask all of my cancer patients, what brings you joy? And the number of cancer patients who tell me that gardening brings them joy is not trivial. I think if you feel that you're dying or part of you has died, the ability to bring life out of the ground is a blessing. And if you can grow your own medicine, that's very empowering.